Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to uh, Carnegie Connects and today's second in a series of virtual briefings, this one on a extremely timely subject, presidential leadership in times of crisis. Before I introduce our extraordinary panel, I want to uh, make a number of brief observations on a subject that I've long been interested in and it's dear to my heart. Um, in a line from Shakespeare's Henry IV, with which Jack Kennedy really loved, one character says to the other, you know, I can summon spirits from the vasty deep, but so can any man, the other replied. The question is, when you call them, do they come? And in, in many respects, I think Kennedy understood the relationship between call, summoning and coming with respect to presidential leadership, particularly in a system like ours, where power, uh, political authority is diffused. It was willfully created that way by the founders to strike a balance between a strong executive and yet separated and shared powers to constrain that executive's um, authority. So the issue in many respects is not summoning. It's can a president work with Congress? Can a president mobilize his cabinet? Can a president deal with a bureaucracy? Um, does the president have a, have a strategy? Can he inspire and motivate? Can he deal with foreign actors even during the domestic crisis? And above all, perhaps, is he curious? I remember as a young INR analyst at the State Department receiving a call one morning from the White House sit room. It was George H.W. Bush on the phone asking me whether I had time to discuss a memo I'd written on Lebanon. And I got off the phone and I thought to myself, this guy knows what he doesn't know, and he's in a hurry to find out. We also know that crisis accentuates presidential leadership. It sets the stage for failure or success in a presidency. Some of our presidents um, coped extremely well, our three undeniably great ones, Washington, Lincoln, F FDR won a century, others, like Herbert Hoover, James Buchanan, uh, stumbled. Uh, and it's no coincidence they were succeeded by two of our greatest. Customers. So I guess the question really is, in, in the end, crises are different, presidents are different, and the political circumstances in which they operate are different. Three sets of questions for our extraordinary panelists. Do What defines presidential greatness and capacity to cope with uh, nation encumbering crisis. Does history have anything to teach us on this or are we simply too distant uh, in time to draw lessons? And finally, of course, how do we evaluate the behavior, conduct and leadership of our current president against the backdrop of an unprecedented crisis, um, a set of circumstances which has produced an unprecedented, an unprecedented president? And um, we have a wealth of talent uh, today to, do, to discuss uh, these, these questions. Uh, first, uh, Douglas Brinkley, who is the Catherine Sonoff Brown Chair in Humanities, uh, professor of history at Rice University, author of uh, several books on president, numerous books on presidential history and American history, most recently, American Moonshot, JFK and the Great Space Race. David Gergen, CNN senior political analyst, professor of public service at Harvard University's Kennedy School, and a former advisor to President Nixon, Reagan, uh, Ford, and Clinton, and author of a book that influenced me, which is Eyewitness to Power. And finally, Ambassador Wendy Sherman, a former colleague of mine at the Department of State, who now directs the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard. Kennedy School and is also the author of a wonderful book, Not for the Faint of Heart, Lessons in Courage, Power, and Persistence. Each will speak for five to eight minutes. Um, I'll pose a set, uh, a set of probably annoying questions to them, and then we'll go to, uh, to your audience. I will also uh, as a question, uh, use the live chat feature uh, in YouTube, email us at press office at ceip.org or tweeted us uh, at Carnegie and Dow using the hashtag Carnegie Connects. So with that said, um, Doug, I'm, I'm turning over the virtual podium to you. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, 
I would begin with thinking about precedence by first saying that character matters. Um, you know, and I, and I particularly say that in US history because we were able to judge the leadership of so many presidents by their military service. I mean, after all, our nation's capitals named after George Washington. We have states of Washington's counties. We, we almost have created a cult of who George Washington was. What he was was an extraordinary leader during the Revolutionary War, a man of in, incredible integrity and, and character and somebody that everybody could trust. So often in American history, there were leadership trials in the military. I don't, I can rattle a few of them off. I mean, but whether it was William Henry Harrison or Andrew Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant or Rutherford B. Hayes, you know, Dwight Eisenhower, you know, there, we've had many great presidents that are, or important presidents that came out of the military service. And ones that didn't want to prove their leadership skills in the military, Theodore Roosevelt, always wanted to be called the colonel because he was so proud that he was able to show his leadership virtues in the Battle of um, San Kettle and um, Kettle Hill and um, San Juan Hill in the Spanish-American War of 1898. John F. Kennedy virtually built his whole um, congressional and then senatorial and then finally presidential campaigns on the PT-109 that when the, the when the, you know, the, the when the big moment came and the bell, danger bell rang, I acted and I have leadership values. So there's a long tradition of us wanting to elect people that have been proven leaders before um, in, in the military field. We have to keep that in mind. It's not such a big deal lately, but if you just think of, you know, we talk about George Herbert Walker Bush was able to show his, what he was made of in World War II as a fly boy. Uh, John McCain, who we all look up to because we look at his leadership skills and how he endured the Vietnam War. Um, and, so I, and I so I think that kind of military leadership showed character. I re could reflect on when Dwight Eisenhower's president, one of the most honest president people I've ever gotten to really understand. Um, you know, he was one of those presidents that when he left office wanted everything he ever signed his name on open. He wasn't embarrassed about anything that he ever wrote Dwight D. Eisenhower on, uh, meaning from a presidential library point of view, he was like, open it, give transparency. I have nothing to hide. Uh, there are no skeletons in my closet. But he was embarrassed with his one big lie during the U-2 incident in 1960 when we lied about a U-2 surveillance plane over Russia and the pilot was shot down and he was caught in a lie. That was one single national security fib, um, trying to protect our, our Cold War infrastructure. And it haunted Eisenhower that he had to make up a lie like that. It haunted him his other bad moment when he didn't fully denounce Joe McCarthy uh, when McCarthy made a swipe at General George Marshall. Um, but that's it. We're looking at two moments and then he would repent and say, you know, I maybe I, I, I was caught in the moment. One case on a political platform, the other trying to do what's right for US national security. Um, and I'm afraid we're losing that, that integrity factor, the character matters, seems to have weakened in, um, in our, our public life. You know, uh, my friend John Meacham, I saw him recently on PBS with Walter Isaacson commenting on, you know, reminding us that in 1964 and 65, their, their trust in the US government in the United States was at 75% in a Gallup poll. 75% of Americans believed in their government in, in 65. It has sunk to historic lows as we're dealing with the pandemic. And it's for many reasons. It's because Lyndon Johnson lied to us often for all of his greatness on civil rights and environment and public education. He lied over and over again about the Vietnam War and people no longer thought he had the, uh, we don't see him having the character of a great, of greatness. Uh, Richard Nixon got tangled up in a wet of lives that led to Watergate and, and many more uh, problems. And he was a, a, a statesperson in many ways, did many interesting things, 1972's breakthrough to China. Um, he created the Environmental Protection Agency in 1971. Clean Air and Water Acts in 72, Endangered Species, dealing with the pollution crisis of the early 70s with great leadership. But his constant line 
and, and not telling truth, not having empirical fact-based evidence made people distrust Richard Nixon. Um, and, you know, it, and so the, it, this starts a kind of corrosion. And then, then we add to the difficulty of leadership. We seem to be choosing people that we think are funny. You know, I used to be one of those people. I said, oh, isn't it great? Jesse Ventura is the governor of, of Minnesota. How interesting. And, you know, we elect a celebrity because they're well known. Well, this comes with great consequences. Uh, the fact that Ronald Reagan pulled it off, uh, was able to be a successful two-term president is lucky. Uh, but he listened to people like George Schultz and James Baker and David Gergens. I mean, they had smart people, like you said at your outset, asking, asking the right questions. He knew what he didn't know. And he also had, due to his re a kind of religious feel that he developed, um, a sense of higher duty to God in many ways, President Reagan. So I don't think it's a partisan thing, but I think we're, we, we, but this idea that presidents, when they talk to you, their words matter, they must mean something. And in our current times that they that science matters do you know in 1960 john f kennedy you know starting won the election that year do you realize time magazine picked scientist as the people of the year in generic scientists there is a belief that we turn it over to experts and that we listen to experts about the atmosphere about the oceans or or about overpopulation and it was a part of um the american way that deteriorated by 1968, certainly by 1970, due to the Vietnam War. Now people saying, well, scientists are making the chemicals of Agent Orange. Scientists are the ones who made DDT. Scientists are the ones that are, you know, poisoning our, our planet. And uh, there was a corrosive um, bit about scientists. And so we're at the point where there's a lot of Americans during something like a pandemic right now that don't believe the scientific community. They're believing their celebrity, partisan, TV anchor, or weird columnist, or something they read on social media. And in a crisis like this, really, you just need a president that could let the, the science community talk with a sense of integrity and purpose. And what I've been frustrated is, is President Trump unable to have the character to be president, um, his slowness out of the gate on, on recognizing the damage of a pandemic. I mean, that big bell rang that did does in wartime and Trump was AWOL uh, because he wanted to wish it away. He worried about the stock market and his political future first. You know what Theodore Roosevelt once said about the stock market? JP Morgan came up to him and said, what you're doing is gonna destroy the stock market and, and Roosevelt said, my administration knows no ticker tape. Um, you know, you can't be running your presidency out of watching the needle on the stock market. It matters, but it can't overwhelm your and, and be that influential over you. And then you can't elect something like Donald Trump, who is, in my view, is has such a narcissistic personality. Um, there, there, everybody knows this about him. Um, there. Every day there's a story about it, but it is a, that it's a malignancy and the malignancy of narcissism can affect the presidency because it's somebody who's incapable of having empathy in a human heart, of telling the truth. Um, they're constantly in spin and self-aggrandizement mode. And unfortunately we've seen too much that of President Clinton, I mean, of President Trump during the pandemic. My last, uh, and I do think we're talking where our leaders, we got to sometime is the problem with Trump is I'd love to cut President Trump slack. I mean, I cut historically Bill Clinton a lot of slack, you know, balanced the budget, expanded NATO, got us out of out of wars, made some obviously the mistake of Lewinsky, but was that worth trying to destroy his presidency, Monica Lewinsky? Um, you know, this sense of destruction of presidents that we're doing also, meaning if leader of who, if we're two Americas and we're in a neo-civil war, I mean, in the civil war, there were two leaders, Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis. Now Davis, we don't treasure or consider a leader anymore, but back then there were two leaders. I'm afraid right now there's like Donald Trump and the, and the anti-Donald Trump 
And it's just it makes it a little tougher to pull the country together. Hence, I feel the leadership now is coming out of the scientists, the medical community, and some excellent governors. Uh, I think uh, Governor Cuomo's done a great job on the left, you know, Democrat. Um, DeWine in Ohio seems to have done a good job. That's heartening to me because it means we're not chasing um, good people out of, of government just to make money in America and become famous. We're actually electing people to public offices. Some of these governors are demonstrating that have grit and character and speak, um, speak truth to power and truth to the American people. And that's been, been impressive for the last few weeks, those governors. Douglas, thanks uh, for that historical context. Competency, character, curiosity, all these things really do count uh, a lot. Uh, David, let me turn it over to you. Sure, and th <clears throat> thank you. It's great to be here with Wendy and with Doug, two uh, well-respected and have people who deserve all the respect they have. And Aaron, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I, I wanna go back to where you started with Henry the IV. Uh, I thought the... Uh, the exchange between Glendower and Hotspur, as I recall, <clears throat> was actually and was so important to Kennedy, uh, actually is uh, important to leadership today. Um, and the when you issue the call, the quality of the call that's issued and the capability of the people who hear the call are both uh, uh, seriously um, in question today. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons we're having so much trouble. I completely agree with, uh, with Doug Brinkley about the importance of character in doing that. But let's go back to the call. One of the lessons we learned, the central lesson we learned from Vietnam, the Vietnam War, was that first you commit the nation and then you commit the troops. Don't do it the other way around. If you have to build up public support for mobilization, for putting people in harm's way, for the body bags that start to come back. Otherwise, what you do have is an erosion of belief in the effort, and the American people turned against the war in Vietnam because we had been lied to so often, and it became apparent that we'd been lied to. Uh, <clears throat> and th that, that, in effect, led to the defeat that we experienced. Had, uh, had Lyndon Johnson, and, and, as well as John Kennedy, but especially Lyndon Johnson, uh, committed the nation up front. Uh, calling us to what this was really going to be and what his strategy would, would be. I think we would have come out of Vietnam a whole lot better off than, than we did. And, and uh, I think that also has relevance for today. The, it, because there are two wars where we, got, where we were lied to up front. One was Vietnam and the other has been this war on, on the virus and on the pandemic. Um, right from the beginning, it wasn't a rallying call. It was a dismissal, a complacency. Uh, that led people to believe this was not a big deal, and it persists even to today. We have yet to have a clarion call from the White House, um, and we have a frequent occasions when the president uh, says one thing, and within a few minutes uh, in a press conference, a narcissistic press conference, he changes his mind or undercuts what he just said. Uh, most recent example, uh, telling us we now should wear masks when we go outside, that that's really important. That's what the CDC is recommending. And who is the number one violator of that? The president himself, he said, I'm not doing that. You know, I've had kings and queens who come visit me, God knows when, um, but there, there he is. <clears throat> and the call has been muffled. And I think what, one of the things that's extremely important in the days ahead, once we reach peak and we begin to sort of look into the future, I think what we do then is really, really important. Uh, to get us through the next phase of this. And I do believe that that's a time when the president ought to have a, a, an Oval Office address or address to the joint session, um, laying out, telling us, and it was speaking, let's put it this, speaking with Nancy Kane, the historian would say, uh, speaking with uh, brutal realism, um, but credible hope. Uh, both are important. There's not been a sense of realism about this coming from the president, it comes from Fauci. And they come from Cuomo. And that's why they, they, the country's clamoring for people who tell the truth and to give them the hard realities. And great leaders do that. Uh, one of the most memorable speeches Winston Churchill ever gave during World War II started with a sentence from Churchill, the news from France is very bad. Mm. And it went on from there. And that's why people followed Churchill, because they thought he was a bulldog. He was fighting back. But he told them the truth. And, and they told them the hard facts, and we simply have, don't have that. And I think that's been critical. I think the president needs to go before the country, 
lay out what the strategy is going to be going forward. Stop the back patting and narcissism and self congratulations. Uh, this is not going to be a victory. No matter how this ends, it's very clear. Anybody who would have imagined a month ago, two months ago, that we're going to have 12,000 people die as of this moment would have said, that's horrible. That is not a good outcome. Uh, so I don't think we ought to be kid ourselves about whether we're winning this or not. We just essentially need to get a truce, if anything, uh, with, this, with this disease. But the other point I, I would like to make is that I also think it matters how the competence of the White House and the, and the centralization of power uh, in a time of warfare, as Lincoln understood, as other great presidents understood, under, have understood, Lincoln didn't, didn't, you know, he paused, but he went forward on abandoning habeas corpus. He used the powers of the presidency wisely. He expanded the powers of the presidency, but his whole point was once the war was over to let those powers snap back, to, to, to bring the presidency back to a smaller place. And in wartime, the president has to do everything he can or she can uh, to mobilize the country. And I think that requires um, the kind, I think we can learn from history there. Uh, and that is the Second World War and Franklin Roosevelt. It, it, we, we have to remember that Roosevelt uh, started out with and working closely with the business community in the, in the first term. Uh, then he had, then they fell, uh, fell into uh, becoming enemies and his inaugural address going into his second term was, and, was, and his whole theme in the second, going into the second term was he welcomed their hatred. But then he realized in order to mobilize um, for the Second World War, which was tricky because he had to bring the country along slowly. He couldn't get too far out in front. He couldn't quarantine, um, uh, you know, Germany the way he gave in a speech in 37. But he was very, very careful about bringing centralizing power. He asked a fellow named William Knudsen, who was then the CEO of General Motors, to come in and run the process of building up the armaments. And he gave that famous speech that we're going to become, the U.S. would become the arsenal of democracy. Uh, and people sort of scoffed at that. And then at that time, we were a very, very weak military power. Uh, I, think our, I think we were, had an army that was smaller than Portugal's as we headed into the Second World War. And Roosevelt need, knew we needed to build up. He went to the experts and said, you know, basically, uh, we're building 6,000 planes a year. How many can we build? Uh, if we really put our minds to it. And the experts came back and said, Mr. President, maybe 25,000. Maybe we could build 25,000 planes a year. And he said, well, it's just not gonna be enough to win the war, we have to do better. And went out and set a public goal, as I recall, of 50,000 planes a year. <clears throat> and most people said it couldn't be done. And hit Roosevelt's view was, you just watch what the American people were capable of if they're well led, if they are rallied, if they're rallied and, and back what's going on. And lo and behold, by the end of the war, we were not building 50,000 planes a year. Essentially, we were building about 75,000 planes a year. Uh, it is striking if you look at Willow Run, which was a Ford Motor Company plant, which converted. By the end of the Second World, by the end of the Second World War, uh, at that Willow Run plant, bombers were coming off the production line. New bombers were coming off that production line one an hour, every 63 minutes on average, three shifts a day, great participation by the workforce. They were able to rally the country and that, that the arsenal of democracy, as, every, as everybody in this conversation knows, uh, that arsenal of democracy uh, idea caught on and it was made a huge difference in the outcome of the war. Just contrast that with what we're doing now. You know, we're flipping and flopping, nobody who's, who knows who's in charge. You know, we have, you know, we have the governors fighting with each other. We have local hospitals desperately looking for, you know, PPE, who ever knew what that term was, not, you know, two months ago. Uh, and it, it is, it's not just this, um, distressing to see, it is actually causing and costing us lives. Uh, I thought the Washington Post headline, that banner headline over their investigative piece on Sunday uh, said it all, 70 days of denial, delays, and dysfunction. We have much to learn from the past. We need Jim Mattis back with his 7,000 books who can help us understand the lessons of the history. Over, uh, over, back over to you, Aaron. David, yeah, that was great. And the balance of real-time experience and historical yeah. perspective. And I'm really impressed that you uh, you know about Glendower and Hotspur. That's really <laughs> quite Well, it's a classic quote and you know. It's uh, a great story yeah. and you can see why yeah. it resonates. Um, yeah. Wendy. Ambassador Furman, yeah, former colleague, please, I'm going to turn it over to you. 
Thank you very much, Aaron, and thank you for having me here today with these two great, uh, both leaders and historians. It's wonderful to listen to both um, Doug and to David, uh, who knows so much about history and have lived so much of it, David in particular, working for so many presidents. At the Center for Public Leadership, which actually David uh, led for 18 years before I uh, came uh, after uh, to build on uh, his vision, we teach students how to become leaders. Uh, Warren Bennis, who wrote the really uh, essential book on becoming a leader, argued that in fact, uh, leaders aren't born, they can indeed be made. Uh, and listening to both Douglas and to David and to your introduction, Erin, uh, listen to what Bennis said were the elements of becoming a leader having a guiding vision, passion, hope, inspiration, integrity, self-knowledge, candor, maturity, trust, being a product of that kind of leadership, curiosity and daring, wonder, not worrying about failure, but wanting to really go forward, lead a group, lead a company, lead a nation. And we've just heard both Douglas and David describe how our current leadership at the national level isn't meeting any of those tests. Bennis went on to say that a leader innovates, develops, focuses on people, not on him or herself, thinks long range, challenges, and rather than learning how to do something right, does the right thing. The moral leadership that Douglas Brinkley and David and my colleagues, Joe Nye, wrote about, about presidents, do morals matter? In fact, morality does matter as a president. It's very curious as I've been thinking about this uh, while we've been living through this horrible time for people who are trying to live their day-to-day -day lives. I almost feel like the president needs a manual uh, for leadership uh, because he didn't learn any of these things. And one of the things that I've gone back to is the 1999 Army Field Manual, uh, which is known in the literature as Be No Do. Uh, it means be the character and courage to do what's right, uh, having values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. Both David and Douglas talked about presidents not telling the truth, about lying. One of the things that Joe Nye talks about in his book, Do Morals Matter? is that all presidents do lie. But the question is, is that lie self-serving and self-regarding or is that lie other regarding? Uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not tell the truth about Len Lease in the first instance because he believed the people couldn't absorb that quite yet. He hadn't set the table in the right way, but he did that to try to in fact do that national call to the country to bring everybody on board. And it was other regarding not self-serving. No in the Army Field Manual is about knowledge and skill sets, interpersonal skills, conceptual skills, technical and tactical skills. And clearly you have to know something or have people around you that you rely on to know something, those scientists, those experts, and do is about providing purpose and direction through action and influence. And interestingly, do doesn't come first. You don't just act on impulse. Do comes after you really bring that courage, that character to the table and the knowledge and expertise, and then you do, you act. I, I wanna read a couple of quotes out of the Army Field Manual that I think are particularly uh, interesting in this time. Uh, the field manual talks about loyalty, which is very important to the President of the United States, though it appears that loyalty for President Trump only goes in one direction. And the field manual says, and I'm quoting here, leaders who know their own capabilities instill self-confidence in people. Don't mistake bluster, loudmouth bragging, or self-promotion for confidence. Truly confident leaders don't need to advertise. Their actions say it all, end quote. Now we live in a world of politics 
and we are coming to a presidential election. So we understand that political leaders do think about their own self-preservation. We're human, uh, but we have seen such a difference as my colleagues have pointed out, Governor DeWine, Governor Hogan, Republicans, Maryland and Ohio, uh, Governor Baker here in Massachusetts, also Republican, then Governor Cuomo, Governor Newsom uh, have shown unbelievable, Governor Inslee in Washington, Democrats, unbelievable leadership along the elements that Ben has laid out. Effective leaders, the Army Field Manuals say, are steady, level-headed under pressure and fatigue, and calm in the face of danger. Leaders finally need troops. As David pointed out, the call comes first, then the troops follow. In my view, we do not have a deep state. We have troops of unbelievable patriotic courage. Every day, we have civil servants, foreign service, military intelligence, grocers, delivery clerks, nurses, orderlies, doctors, sanitation workers, postal workers, and more who are our troops. And they are desperate to be led. They are desperate to have a leadership who brings what they need to the table so that they can get their jobs done. You know, uh, it's ironic that in Chinese, the character for crisis, which is certainly what we're in, is both danger and opportunity. A real leader needs, needs to understand the dangers and harness the opportunity and bring those elements that Venice laid out so early in the literature around how to be a leader to the table. We're not seeing that in our current leader. We are relying on our governors. And the real challenge for us in this time is that we are seeing Newsom gather governors together to create a national response on how PPE, how ventilators are distributed when in fact that should be coming from our central government. And the last point I'll make is that many of us, myself included, are conflicted about the centralization that is needed here because I have an anxiety that that centralization will not snap back in the way Abraham Lincoln said it should, that the President Trump, if he is reelected, will hold on to that centralized authority will not let it go, that the authoritarianism we are seeing worldwide will grow and democracy will weaken. And that is not good for who we are. It is not who we are, but that is what we may see here and around the world. I'll stop there. That was, that was really a masterclass in uh, the generic qualities of leadership. And I, I just want to pick up on, on one point you raised. We have a lot of questions, so I, I may only ask each of you one, one common question. In each of the nation encumbering crises that we faced, um, one in the 18th, one in the 19th, and one in the 20th century, we ended up fortuitously, how, how it happened, I don't understand, in, in essentially producing the three greatest undeniably undeniably greatest presidents. They only, not only managed the crisis transactionally, each of them were able to extract some sort of uh, transformational development that changed the country forever for the better. And that is the issue of crisis as, oppor as opportunity. This crisis is virtually unprecedented. I mean, Woodrow Wilson in the, in the face of the 1918 pandemic Spanish flu did not issue a single statement or mobilize the fe federal resources to deal with this, largely because he was caught up in mobilization for World War I. That's a, a very intriguing and I think depressing point. Will we emerge from this crisis as we emerge from both the Civil War, Reconstruction notwithstanding, and from World War II, stronger at home with more influence abroad? And that's very troubling to me. My question to you, to the three of you before we, we move into callers' questions is this. Aaron Sorkin, creator of West Wing, wants to define the White House as the greatest home court advantage. 
And yet we seem uniquely preternaturally ill-prepared always to deal with crises. We may adjust and adapt. Lincoln had 26,000 troops at the time of Fort Sumter. Even Roosevelt would admit that Pearl Harbor was an intelligence failure. 9-11, Katrina, Andrew before that in 1992. Have we overestimated the power of the president and the presidency to place a sort of redemptive and salvation role? And I, I, I wonder about this, um, not that I don't share your misgivings and, and uh, difficulties with the current leadership, but are we expecting too much, not just from this president, but from previous ones as well? David, first to you. Well, <clears throat> I don't, <clears throat> I think we sometimes on a, in normal times without a crisis, I think we do expect too much from our presidents. We expect them to be able to wage, uh, wave a magic wand and, and make jobs appear to make us competitive, to make us better than the Chinese and everything else. Um, and, um, but I do think that if you look at the, the three presidents, D Doug Brinkley can uh, correct me, but I think generally speaking, historians say that we had three great presidents, Washington, Lincoln, and FDR. Um, and what you find in each one of those cases was they were, when the crisis arose, it came in the wake of really ineffective leadership and people were clamoring for something stronger. You know, you come out of the, out of the uh, Confederation in the beginning, which, you know, fell apart and people wanted to bring a George Washington in and wrote a constitution so they could have more power in the presidency. Similarly, with coming into the Civil War with Buchanan and the failures of Buchanan, people were looking for someone who could be more effective. And I think it was obviously true with Hoover uh, giving way to Roosevelt, much the same thing. And I think the question becomes, do, they, do these people, and we were fortunate that we had three men of character who also were not afraid of power and were understood how to exercise power effectively, which they did. And I think we needed them. And that was the marvel of the system that we could actually expand power for that brief period of time, but then have it snap back. And the snap back quality is really, really important. Let me just make one other comment while, while we're here. Um, and that is it, coming out of this, it does seem to me that we ought to be one of the silver lines potentially, one of the opportunities coming out of this is to change the way we think about preparedness and look into the future. We have missed signals again and again on what's coming. Uh, I, I just came across a story uh, yesterday, Aaron, I did not, I'd never heard this before, uh, but I, I saw it was print story. And that is that when George W. Bush was president in his second year, in his first year after 2005, after being reelected, he was home in Texas during the summer. He got a book by a guy named uh, uh, Barry, John Barry, on the great epidemic. He got yeah. the advanced copy. He read the book. He got totally alarmed. This is George W. Bush, calls his advisor, Fran Tom, uh, Townsend and others together and say, we're not going to have a pandemic on my watch, I don't think, but it's going to come. And America must be prepared. He put $7 billion into it. Uh, they, they came up with a plan. And guess what? They came out and learned from the 1918, the importance of social distancing. Um, they learned all the lessons we're relearning now. Uh, but they made a real effort. And then it faded away. You know, the effort and the attempt because other things were distracting. We need, uh, just as we've had a defense advisory board, for the president, which I think has been invaluable over time. People from both parties sitting down and talking wisely with the president. Um, we need some sort of mechanism, whether it's a preparedness advisory board for the president and for the country, that we can see things coming earlier and can be more prepared than we are. There's nothing more important right now than to have a preparedness uh, for climate change. You know, we're not doing that. We're, we're being complacent about that, just as we were complacent about the pandemic. And it's going to hit us and hit us and hit us unless we get serious about the way we look ahead into the future. There will be a COVID-19 commission, I'm almost certain. Yeah, I'm sure that'll look back though. Uh, what, what we do need is, you know, the guy at uh, uh, UVA uh, who uh, headed up the 9-11 uh, commission. Um, uh, yeah, who, Phil, who, who, Phil Zellico. Who, Phil Zellico, he did a very good job of that. Doug, a thought? Um, a few. Um, Wendy had mentioned we were when we were talking about character, 
and presidents that made me think of a story when Jimmy Carter ran for president in 1976 and he was running on, I will never tell a lie. I've never told a lie. I'm an honest man. I never will tell a lie. And uh, finally a reporter from New York came down to Plains, Georgia to talk to Ms. Lillian and got, and Ms. Lillian said, welcome to Plains. You look beautiful here. Would you like some tea? How was your journey? It's so wonderful for you to visit me. And the reporter cut right in and said, your son is saying he's never told a lie as a mother. Are you really telling me that he never told a lie? Jimmy never told, ever. And she said, Miss Lillian, oh, Jimmy tells white lies all the time, but he doesn't lie. And <laughs> the, then the reporter said, well, that's your, your, I don't understand. A white lie is a lie. And Miss Lillian said, no, it isn't. And, and the reporter said, yes, it is. Well, wh what's the difference, a white lie and a lie? Give me an example. And Ms. Lillian said, well, remember when I said how nice it was to see you and welcome to Plains? That was the white lie. Um, the, the point being that we, the, of course, uh, presidents and leaders will exaggerate, uh, will, will speak in hyperbole from time to time. But I'm afraid when you look at the number of lies, just direct falsehoods and twists of facts that President Trump has unleashed upon the land, and promoting of conspiracy history and conspiracy theories all the time and half-baked ideas. I've never seen anything like that in presidential leadership. Uh, James Buchanan, for but ranked the worst, didn't act that way. Warren Harding had scandals, but he didn't act in such a way to constantly be flooding um, the public sphere with um, you know, a lies, lies every day. Um, but I think we're going to get through all this. I'm very hopeful about it. I think David Gergen just touched on the key thing. You know, I, I was living in New Orleans at the time of Katrina. I was teaching at Tulane. I ended up writing a book called The Great Deluge, all about it. And there, the, I found out everybody in New Orleans and the Gulf South, where's the federal government? Where's Bush? Where is, you know, and days went by. We lost a lot of people in Katrina because in rescue and response, you have a 48-hour window before people will die from not having a ventilator or their medications got flooded or um, they, they have a heart attack, it can't be treated. And we failed during Katrina, but there are a hundred white papers out there about what we should do, but the city never prepared. We were below sea level. And, um, and alas, I realized that it was Louisianans saving Louisianans and Mississippi saving Mississippians, meaning the federal government was overrated on what they were going to swoop in like a cavalry and solve all the problems. And alas, um, they didn't. FEMA was AWOL, as we all know. Uh, and George W. Bush, in that instance, did his famous flyover. Um, and, and people I talked to all over New Orleans, I was there through this all, and particularly in the African American community, would say, you know, 1965, when Hurricane Betsy hit, Lyndon Johnson came down here and he shined a flashlight and went in a boat at night and asked people if they were all right. Presidents have to show empathy and heart and compassion. It's almost now become a job description because President Obama was so good at it, that grief counselor in chief, the mm -hmm. hand holder, the rabbi, the pre people need to be reassured in the right way. So it was said earlier, if you can be fact-based and I love the term of brutal realism. You need brutal realism right now. And then you need to have an open heart and be empathetic and, and have a healing uh, nature about you. The only big uh, moment I saw President Trump do is he went on the medical, you know, went on a ship and just stood there for no purpose but to have a TV commercial. Uh, I haven't felt the amount of the proper amount of grieving for the people that are dying and for the losses we're having. So he's, he's just not the right president for a moment. I will add, we've got to protect the election in 2020. Uh, we wonder why we got through these things. It, every four years we vote and we have to have a free and fair election. We might have to do voting, um, you know, but, uh, we might have to do write-in voting. We have to figure it out very, very quickly. But in 1864, or Lincoln, we ran a presidential election. He got reelected. FDR got reelected in 1944. These are the two of the darkest years in American history, and we ran presidential elections. And in fact, 
uh, James Madison in, in 1812, this, we, we ran it in the uh, War of 1812, but in 1814, uh, when the Washington DC was burning, we ran an election from a, a I mean, in, in um, you know, right after, you know, so I just, the, the idea is we've got to kind of forge forward with our electoral process because if you're unhappy with Trump's leadership, I don't think his personality, his narcissism is going away in the next months. You have to do it at the ballot box. And I get worried. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really grateful that Congress is the one who gets to dictate the election day, not a president. But we, as we saw the Wisconsin primary, you know, shut down, right? You know, people are trying to sh start, how are we going to do this in 2020? We really better put some thought to it to have a free and fair election because nothing makes de uh, our democracy prouder than if we can do elections that are run properly. The empathy and compassion is critical and our best presidents had this capacity to turn the M and me upside down. So it became a W in we, and that's critically important. Wendy, to you uh, on just, this issue. Yeah, just a couple of points on all this. Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin in her wonderful book along with David's and Doug's uh, terrific books. Um, talks about leadership and looks at presidents and notes that it, the presidents who were most successful grew as a human being in office. They were self-reflective. They met the moment um, when they were confronted with a crisis. Lincoln, FDR, of course, Washington being people that we all know, but even Teddy Roosevelt met a moment Early in his career, he was completely hopeless. If you read about Teddy Roosevelt, you would have thought he was just a rich joker who should never be a leader, but he grew. He became self-reflective. His, his uh, foray out West actually uh, imbued him with a different sense of himself and his purpose and his grounding in life. We have not seen any growth in President Trump. There has not been self-reflection and insight. There has not been a sense, if, if there's any sense of the other, of people, of folks' day-to-day -day lives, it's because people have given him a piece of paper to read, not because that is his instinct and his own self-reflection and his own growth. <clears throat> a couple of other points. On preparedness, uh, Obama understood this and created an office in the White House in preparedness after the Ebola crisis. And the fact that that office was dismantled is one of the great tragedies. I quite agree with David and Ben Rhodes has just written a piece in The Atlantic about how we're gonna have to think about our national security foreign policy uh, very differently. We're gonna have to organize very differently because most of the crises that are gonna come at us are transnational, whether they're viruses or climate or the need for water or food security. These are all things, supply chains. These are all things that are globalized now. And there will be a lot of retraction after this crisis. People will go inward. They will try to create their own supply chains inside of countries. They will, I believe, sadly become more centralized and autocratic. But to get to where we need to in the world, we are interconnected. Climate knows no boundaries. Viruses know no boundaries. And we will have to organize in a different way. And then the last point I'll make is um, to actually, the importance of courage. It's the first chapter in my own book because without courage to do hard things in difficult times, to do the right thing, to do the moral thing, you can't get anywhere. You cannot make anything happen. No one will answer the call unless you show that courage move forward. And then my last point, is to urge everyone to read Bill Burns, the head of Carnegie Endowment in the Atlantic this uh, week as well, which talks about how we are going to have to approach the world differently, how the trends that we are seeing today did not just arrive with the Trump presidency. They didn't arrive with the Obama presidency either or the Bush presidency. They've been going on for some time. We need to understand those trends. We need to approach the world and how we lead in the world as the United States of America in quite a different way than we have in the past. Wendy, thank you. Uh, we have quite a few questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, but um, I will probably separate them out. Uh, John Rash from the Minneapolis Star Tribune asked, 
uh, and Doug, I think this is for you and, and or David. How, how have past presidents worked with the media during times of crisis? How does this contrast with today's presidential press dynamic? I, I, I suspect we could spend another 45 minutes on that question, but um, I think honesty and clarity uh, are missing. But uh, Doug, uh, any sense, um, any anecdotes, examples you might want to share? When Walter Cronkite left CBS News, his last interview, he interviewed Ronald Reagan in March of 1981. But when that whole long Cronkite era, um, journalism had about a 70 to 75 percent approval rating by the American <laughs> people. Meaning we were all, for better or for worse, people were getting their nightly news. They, he was called the most trusted man in America, Walter Cronkite. People kind of believed. Uh, they corralled around the television and believed Walter Cronkite. Today, we're looking at and good the best polls, a, a 20 percent. Uh, but some are around 16% of trust in media from 75 to 20 due to the internet, due to social media, due to the, everybody getting to boutique choose the, you know, what type of news they want. Their people are actually shopping for the facts that they want to hear. That is a big problem. It used to be the journalists were closer to government at times. I mean, you look at uh, and Cronkite himself became considered a cheerleader for NASA, uh, a government agency. But Scotty Reston and, and um, you know, there were always, um, um, you know, Johnny Apple. Um, there are always people that were kind of working for the New York Times or Washington Post that had a real relationship with the president, Ben Bradley. I suppose this president sees his, his view of what is the journalist media world as Fox News is um, alt-right alt sites, um, and that's what he uh, doubles down on. My one encounter with President Trump at Mar-a-Lago, uh, he was waxing on to me about, he used the term press lord, Rupert Murdoch, who are these other nobodies in the media? The press lord is Murdoch. Uh, um, that's how he thinks in the terms of as long as he can keep Murdoch um, happy and, and deal with that, he can manipulate the media. Uh, I think, though, the heroic news here is our journalists are doing a great job. They have been. And people like Maggie Haberman, Haberman, it's just stunning. Peter Baker, the, all the Times and the Post are doing some of their best journalism, Wall Street Journal. Um, so the reporters are there doing their job, thank goodness, or we really would be turned dizzy right now by the White House. Uh, but you can find what's going on there. Um, due to uh, other government agencies that are circumventing around Trump and uh, these great heyday, you know, of, um, of good um, journalism. But I'm afraid it's hard, you know, I'll end by just saying Walter Cronkite himself once told me the biggest problem he saw, I had written a book on Cronkite, so I got to know him well. And, his, and he had said the biggest problem of all the problems a man that many decades in journalism said is the way we're turning information over to 12 year olds and 14 year olds. Here's your iPhone, go surf the World Wide Web. No class, no middle school class, he said, or something showing them how to properly use it, how the Associated Press story is different from some other story. And so we're, we're all guilty of turning over these, these contraptions filled with misinformation and kids start tapping into the, these things. So one, one thing we might need to revisit somewhere is how our schools can start teaching how to use the tool that everybody has in their hands, how to understand what's fact and what's a lie um, and what's, a, what's been sourced and what's unsourced uh, instead of just streaming all over the map. Thanks. Uh, David, let me go to you, not on this question, but on another, because there are a few I'd like to get in. Patrick K asks in an email, does there need to be a trade-off in a crisis, presumably, between leadership at home and leadership abroad? Well, Patrick, I'm not quite sure what that means. Let me just say that in the, in the Second World War, uh, the United States exercised leadership overseas as well as at home, and it was critical uh, to the success in the war. Uh, and here, one of the, uh, the, the great, um, uh, I think one of the great failings uh, is that it's every nation for itself that the United States right up front 
I made it made it clear that uh, we were going to take do whatever it takes to protect our citizens. We even, you know, we tried. We went into Germany and tried to, uh, uh, you know, buy up for exclusive use by the United States uh, treatments out, out of the German pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the the president, uh, you know, slammed the door on European travel to the United States without once calling uh, the leaders of other countries in Germany or elsewhere. Um, but very, very importantly, if we, I think if this had been a more collaborative approach, we would our scientists would be comparing notes. There'd be a lot of data collection going across uh, nations, uh, and we'd be a lot further ahead in trying to understand what we're dealing with. Um, and there just simply hasn't been the kind of collaborative spirit that we found during World War II uh, when we were in a war. There's not that collaborative spirit in this war, and I think it is um, it's a real shortcoming. And I do also think it is. Uh, once again, imperiled a great number of Americans. Uh, one question, uh, which I'm sure you could all answer uh, or have views on is uh, previous administrations, uh, did previous administrations <clears throat> with strong cabinet members push back against um, the president's incl inclination or strong views on subject X, Y, or Z? Any thoughts on that one? <laughs> Uh, go ahead, David, if you want, I'll-, I'll no, no, go ahead, Wendy, I'll, yeah, please. So, absolutely. Uh, when I was in the Clinton administration, I remember well when President Clinton made a decision around welfare reform that Peter Edelman, who was a strong advisor, left the government. Uh, we, uh, everyone uh, knows of the famous mm -hmm. diplomat Dick Holbrook, he and Tony Lake, who was national security advisor to Bill Clinton. Uh, left the Foreign Service over the Vietnam War. Um, there have been other cabinet officers. I believe that we certainly watched Secretary Mattis, uh, the Secretary of Defense in this administration, stay for as long as he could. I think he believed he was protecting the Constitution. He was protecting his troops uh, against uh, what he thought might end up being an illegal order. Uh, and then when he just could not do it anymore, uh, he left the government, much to our detriment. And I wish Secretary Mattis, who had taken off his uniform to be the Secretary of Defense, left his uniform off and felt he could continue to be uh, constructively critical of the administration. Instead, he reverted to the fact that he was former military and should not critique uh, a sitting president. So I think having those voices is critical, but what we have now is fear, staggering, staggering fear. We've just seen that when Captain Crozier of the US Roosevelt stood up for his troops as a leader in a really extraordinary way, maybe already knowing he had COVID-19 himself, uh, he was taken down by the acting secretary of the Navy Mobley because Mobley was afraid that that's what the President of the United States wanted. Mobley's job was insecure to begin with. Uh, he thought this would give him job security. Uh, it is in fact, I think, left him more secure, insecure than ever because he then went on the ship and really uh, said terrible things about Captain Crozier who was beloved by his troops because he had given his troops loyalty and his troops gave him loyalty back. So I think it's a very present example of what leadership is about, the failure to understand what leading troops is all about, and we are all the worse for it. Yeah, briefly, briefly. George Schultz's decision in 1985 to publicly oppose the Reagan administration's executive order. I remember well his speech uh, in the face of uh, polygraphs, not only for State Department employees, but for thousands of, uh, of others who worked, to, worked in the government. Yeah, Did you have Aaron, a point? Yeah. I just want to point out that, yeah, I, I, I do think of the Mobley Crozier, the wrong man resigned. I, uh, Wendy's got it absolutely right on that. You know, we have had examples when, when there has been someone in the administration that's sort of the, the uh, resistance voice uh, and has not been listened to. And that was particularly true of George Ball uh, in the yeah, Vietnam War. And, and instead, what we had, what was called groupthink thereafter within that small group of people around Lyndon Johnson, and I think it really harmed the war. But if you want to say two examples of, of people who, who did push back and in a very effective way, one was um, uh, George Marshall. 
he was willing to stand up more, more than once uh, uh, over the course of his career when people thought he would ruin his career, step, uh, vo give voice to an alternative perspective. Uh, it actually enhanced his power and he became an invaluable, uh, you know, I think he's a role model for so many people who come through. Um, but the, uh, the, uh, during the, the, other, the other moment was 13 days. You know, and and, uh, and there was we the, the people around Kennedy and Kennedy himself seemed to reach one consensus, and then Bobby Kennedy started speaking out against it. The Treasury Secretary, a Republican, started speaking out against the consensus, and they shifted over time. And that shift by questioning the first presidential consensus by challenging that first one saved us from a nuclear conflict. Last question before we close for me, um, Jonathan Alter wrote, I think right in a way, all presidents are blind dates. So <laughs> what I'd last, I'd, la I'd want all of you to sum up in one sentence, what is the most essential quality that Americans need to look for in choosing their presidents? Forget resumes, experience is important. I mean, Buchanan had the best resume in the biz and he turned out to be a very bad crisis manager. Lincoln effectively had no resume, a one-term congressman. So in one sentence, the interest of time, uh, Wendy to you first, what is the key ingredient here? To have the courage to do what's right, even if it comes at a cost. David? Character, I think Doug Brinkley had it right from the beginning. And Doug? Yeah, I mean, character, honesty, forthrightness, and not putting um, your political future ahead of what's best for America. Uh, be more like a Harry Truman figure where the buck really does stop and then you're able to make the hard decisions for the country uh, irrespective of whether it, it's, it's good for your um, you know, political future. Look, I can't, thank, I can't thank the three of you enough. This has been an extraordinary, very important conversation. On behalf of Carnegie, though, let me thank you for Terrific presentations, perspective, real-time experience. It really was a, a masterclass. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody on the line uh, who called in and uh, stay safe uh, and stay healthy. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Bye, Aaron. Bye, David. Bye, Wendy. Yeah, take care. Bye, -bye everybody. Take care.